In 2004, a man named Barack Obama was nowhere near running for president of the United States. He was a state senator from Illinois who was just running for a U.S. Senate seat. But way back then, in July 2004, people across the country started talking about Barack Obama as a potential future presidential candidate. And it was because of this speech. There is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. There is not a black America and a white America and Latino America and Asian America. There's the United States of America. The pundits, the pundits like to slice and dice our country into red states and blue states, red states for Republicans, blue states for Democrats. But I've got news for them, too. We worship an awesome God in the blue states, and we don't like federal agents poking around in our libraries in the red states. We coach Little League in the blue states, and yes, we've got some gay friends in the red states. There are patriots who oppose the war in Iraq, and there are patriots who supported the war in Iraq. We are one people, all of us pledging allegiance to the Stars and Stripes, all of us defending the United States of America. Barack Obama speaking at the 2004 Democratic National Convention, which nominated John Kerry, who lost to George W. Bush. Now more than seven years later, with the Republican Party locked in its own alternately hilarious and intense race for a presidential candidate to run against him. Today, I think for the first time, now President Obama spoke in a way that brought back that 2004 speech, that United States of America speech that made the Democratic political world sit up and take his measure when he was still just a state senator from Illinois. But to go back to 2004 today, President Obama went back even further. He went 101 years back to 1910, when Republican Teddy Roosevelt gave his famously progressive new nationalism speech in Osawatomie, Kansas. Osawatomie, Kansas is the same city where President Obama spoke today, giving a, frankly, what was a barn burner of a populist speech that If this is going to be the template for his reelection effort, this is once again going to make the Democratic political world sit up and take notice. This is not just another political debate. This is the defining issue of our time. This is a make or break moment for the middle class and for all those who are fighting to get into the middle class. Because... What's at stake is whether this will be a country where working people can earn enough to raise a family, build a modest savings, own a home, secure their retirement. Now, in the midst of this debate, there are some who seem to be suffering from a kind of collective amnesia. After all that's happened, after the worst economic crisis, the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, They want to return to the same practices that got us into this mess. In fact, they want to go back to the same policies that stacked the deck against middle-class Americans for way too many years. And their philosophy is simple. We are better off when everybody is left to fend for themselves and play by their own rules. I am here to say they are wrong. And in 1910, Teddy Roosevelt came here to Osawatomie, and he laid out his vision for what he called a new nationalism. Our country, he said, means nothing unless it means the triumph of a real democracy, of an economic system under which each man shall be guaranteed the opportunity to show the best that there is in him. Now, for this, Roosevelt was called a radical. He was called a socialist. 
even a communist. But today we are a richer nation and a stronger democracy because of what he fought for in his last campaign. An eight-hour workday and a minimum wage for women. Insurance for the unemployed and for the elderly and those with disabilities. Political reform and a progressive income tax. I'm here in Kansas to reaffirm my deep conviction that we're greater together than we are on our own. I believe that this country succeeds when everyone gets a fair shot, when everyone does their fair share, when everyone plays by the same rules. These aren't Democratic values or Republican values. These aren't 1% values or 99% values. They're American values, and we have to reclaim them. The president today harking back to that 2004 awesome God in the blue states, one United States of America speech, which put him on the national map for the first time in that summer convention speech when John Kerry was being nominated. President Obama, in giving the speech today and probably providing a preview of what his campaign is going to be like, is sort of calling a Republican bluff in some ways. The guy he is giving a shout out to here is Teddy Roosevelt, of course, a Republican. Uh, Newt Gingrich, the current Republican frontrunner for the Republican presidential nomination, likes to call himself a Teddy Roosevelt Republican. And as President Obama pointed out today, Teddy Roosevelt's agenda would be derided as communist in the current political climate even if no one would be demanding to see his birth certificate. When Teddy Roosevelt went to Kansas in 1910, he went there to say that just as the special interests of cotton and slavery had threatened the nation's integrity before the Civil War, so now the great special business interests too often control and corrupt the men and methods of government for their own profit. He said, we must drive the special interests out of politics. Roosevelt said in that speech that day that the Constitution does not give the right of suffrage to any corporation. The citizens of the United States must, effect, must effectively control the mighty commercial forces which they have called into being. He said laws should be passed to prohibit the use of corporate funds directly or indirectly for political purposes. Corporate expenditures, he said, corporate expenditures for political purposes have supplied one of the principal sources of corruption in our political affairs. In 1910, Teddy Roosevelt was making essentially an anti-Citizens United speech. I mean, and this is the speech, as you heard President say, he called for an income tax, he called, he called for an estate tax, an inheritance tax, he called for an investigation into the financial system to stop financial panics. And Teddy Roosevelt was actually called a socialist for saying all that. If our political institutions were perfect, he said, they would absolutely prevent the political domination of money in any part of our affairs. Of course they called him a communist for that. Teddy Roosevelt, a Republican president, gave that speech in 1910, about a year after leaving the White House. President Obama reiterated those populist themes today. There's no tape of Roosevelt's Kansas speech. Give me a break, it was 1910. But if you want to imagine Teddy Roosevelt giving that speech today, if you want to imagine what it would sound like to hear it today, you might want to imagine it being given with the aid of a people's mic. Joining us now here in Washington is Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown of the great state of Ohio. Senator Brown, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you back, Rachel. Thank you. Um, today's speech um, had a pretty overtly populist message from, from President Obama. Do you feel like that is the, the right note to be sounding uh, in today's politics and in today's economy? Yeah, it's, it's the right note for a couple of reasons. First of all, this whole view from many in the mainstream media that populism is about a bunch of, bunch of people with pitchforks storming the castle has it wrong. I mean, clearly what populism is, is fighting for workers, fighting for fair trade, fighting for jobs, taking on special interests. When Wall Street does what it does, when uh, insurance companies or drug companies do what they do. And uh, that's exactly why his, that's why his tone was exactly right. But to me, it, it's, it's more interesting, not so much this is the beginning of his campaign and the impact it has on campaigns. My interest is the impact it has on the Congress to finally move away from special interests and do what we ought to do on infrastructure, on jobs generally, on the payroll tax, on protecting Medicare, all the things that we should be doing. I'm hoping the president's clarion call gets us going in the right direction. Uh, 
forget about the campaign for a while, get this country back on track. One of the things he specifically called out today was the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Agency. We associate that with Elizabeth Warren, who is now running for Senate uh, in uh, Massachusetts, likely against Scott Brown, um, and who is famous for having championed that idea. But she is not the nominee to run that agency. Richard Cordray is the nominee. And President Obama specifically called for him to be approved by the Senate today. Senate Republicans say they, they, they will block him, not just because of specific not because of specific objections to him, but because they don't like the whole idea of the agency. What do you yeah, think is going to happen? I know Richard that? Cordray well. He was attorney general in my state in yeah. Ohio. Uh, he was chosen to be the top number two person by Elizabeth Warren. He's qualified Republicans and Democrats business uh, and all kinds of people in Ohio, including some banks, community banks are supporting him, all kinds of people in Ohio. And this is the first time in, in American history. I asked the Senate historian this question, Rachel. It's the first time in American history that a nominee has been blocked by a political party um, because they don't like the agency. It's got nothing to do with Rich Cordray. It's got, a, it's got everything to do with they don't think there should be a strong consumer protection agency with teeth because they know that a lot of the gaming, whether it's credit cards or whether it's, uh, it's the Volcker rule or whether it's a whole host of other things, the gaming of the system will stop with a strong consumer protection voice with real, real teeth and real authority in that office can operate. Do you think there's any prospect of that budget? Well, the president we're, we're, pressuring we're, it and putting pressure on it on a, in a big high profile speech like this today seems to me like they might think there's some room for movement. Well, so far, um, one Republican support is supporting him. I'm hopeful that we get another seven or eight tomorrow. The vote will be either tomorrow or Thursday. Um, I, I will be will be battling for him. It's just I mean, it's amazing to me that after going through all of this, so what the president just said in that speech in Kansas, he talked about collective amnesia that far too many people in Congress have that are so tied to special interests, this collective amnesia of we forget what happened. And one of the reasons it happened is because there wasn't a consumer watchdog on the beat. And now we'll have a consumer watchdog if we confirm Richard Cordray for this position. In terms of the other things that the president is calling for, the other things that go along with his jobs agenda and with this this populist message and populist politics that he's articulating now, uh, we're still looking on looking at the payroll tax extension. We're looking at the extension of unemployment benefits. What do you think is going to happen on both of those issues? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I think the, I have called on the majority leader, as others have. We should stay into Christmas, on Christmas, through Christmas, in order to make sure that we finish, we, we get our job done in extending unemployment benefits. Uh, 70,000 people in Ohio will lose their benefits January 1st. Many more than that in the course of the year. That's just my state, the seventh largest state in the country. Hundreds of thousands will lose their benefits. Uh, and the payroll tax is worth $1,400 to the average family in Ohio and across the country. And if we take that payroll tax cut away, it's going to mean, one, a declining. It will hurt the economy, undoubtedly. Mark Sandy, uh, the, the top economist for, for John McCain's campaign in 08, Barclays, others have said it will mean hundreds of thousands of, job, of jobs lost if we don't do that because it will put money in middle class people's pockets who will, who will spend it and will create demand for more products causing companies to hire more people because there's more demand for their products. It's simple capitalism. And, and the special interests, people in the Senate and the House have just neglected that, that economics lesson. John Kyle says that he will only uh, see, to see that it gets extended if uh, the Bush tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans get extended, too. Yeah. Uh, it, in the end, you, it, it, this, is, this is not hard to analyze, as you know. In the end, it it's always comes back to protecting the wealthiest 1% of people in this, in this country. And I, I know you're going to have somebody on later about uh, Occupy Boston or Occupy D.C. And, you know, wh whether, whatever, whatever people think of that, it's clear that, that far too many people in the Senate, in the end, want to protect the 1%, as if that's what made the country prosperous. I mean, the 1% does better when the 99% do well. And uh, I, from Teddy Roosevelt through Franklin Roosevelt through Barack Obama, we know that. Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio, thanks for coming in. It's oh, nice it's to see you in person. Thank you. Thank nice you, sir. Again. Thanks. All right. Next, we celebrate a very special anniversary for a man named Newt Gingrich. We will be celebrating this anniversary whether Mr. Gingrich wants us to or not. That's the thing about the public record. It's recorded publicly. Please stay with us.